जी एक्सक्यूज मी सो नेक्स्ट सेशन इज अबाउट टू कमेंस एंड नेक्स्ट सेशन इज ऑफ पैथोलॉजी दिस वुड बी द फर्स्ट सेशन ऑफ पैथोलॉजी एंड डॉक्टर उमर निसार शेख ही इज मॉडरेटिंग दिस सेशन फ्रॉम लाहौर वर्चुअली हॉस्पिटल annual shaukat khanum cancer symposium uh, i would also like to extend my deep uh, regards to the esteemed speakers who have traveled long way uh, and also to those who have uh, taken their precious time to record videos for the symposium so <clears throat> today's session is split in two pathology uh, session number 1 and 2 each would have two 45 minutes long talks followed by a question and answer session uh, we would request you to send your questions and save them to the last and send us via zoom link and uh, we will ask the esteemed speakers at the end uh, i truly hope that your time will be well spent and uh, deeply rewarding so i am pleased to uh, <clears throat> invite my first speaker dr khaled amin Uh, who is an associate professor in University of Minnesota Minneapolis uh, USA uh, he is uh, uh, currently practicing surgical pathology and cytopathology with special interest in gastrointestinal and hepatic pathology um, he has published quite a bit and uh, has published more than 80 article 80 articles in peer reviewed journal he is currently holding a position of section editor in american society of clinical pathology cytology report section uh, so without further delay we will start the first session and the first uh, the title of his first talk is hepatocellular neoplasm classification of hepatic adenomas and hepatocellular carcinoma variants so let's begin hello sir bismillah Assalamu alaikum everybody uh, today my talk is geared towards hepatocellular neoplasms it has two parts um, in the first part i will discuss uh, hepatocellular adenomas and in the second uh, part i will uh, discuss various subtypes of hepatocellular carcinoma so rapid advances over the past decade or so in the molecular and anatomical pathology have greatly improved our understanding of hepatocellular adenomas this has led to a clinically relevant histology based classification that identifies hepatic adenomas at the greatest risk of malignant transformation this new classification system has led to general consensus on major subtypes of hepatic adenomas However, controversy remains regarding how to incorporate less common types of hepatic adenomas into the classification system and how to incorporate adenoma subtyping into the clinical cares. So, hepatic adenomas are basically benign clonal proliferation of phenotypically mature hepatocytes. Microscopically, they show minimal to no cytological or architectural atypia. genetically uh, they are chromosomal stable with very few mutations as compared to hepatocellular carcinomas hepatic adenosis is defined as 10 or more adenomas an important point to note about adenomas is that they occur in liver uh, without cirrhosis uh, whereas hepatocellular carcinomas uh, mostly occur in uh, patients with cirrhosis there are some recognized uh, risk factors uh, that include uh, steatosis and uh, steatohepatitis particularly related uh, to inflammatory adenomas uh, an important point uh, to remember when diagnosing hepatic adenomas that it is highly discouraged to make a diagnosis of hepatic adenoma in a needle biopsy obtained from a nodule uh, in a cirrhotic liver and this is uh, because um the regenerative nodules in cirrhotic liver can show aberrant expression of many of the markers that we currently employ for uh 
classification of hepatocellular adenomas. About 80 to 90 percent of hepatic, uh, in about 80 to 90 percent of hepatic adenomas, there are certain risk factors that can be recognized. Uh, they occur, uh, these adenomas occur mostly in women who are taking exogenous estrogens, uh, mainly in form of uh, oral contraceptives, um, and also in women uh, who have fatty liver disease. Uh, also, adenomas are uh, seen in increased, uh, or the increased incidence of adenomas in um, people who are taking um, androgen um, as a, as a recreational use or um, as a th for therapeutic purposes. Also, there are um, acquired and genetic diseases uh, that can uh, lead to increased incidence of uh, adenomas. Um, they, uh, they include Abernathy syndrome, uh, which causes abnormal hepatic inflow, and uh, bird carry syndrome, which causes abnormal blood outflow. Uh, certain genetic diseases that has been associated with um, adenomas include uh, glycogen storage disease, uh, primarily type 1, and um, mccune albite syndrome, uh, which causes um, precocious uh, puberty. And because of uh, this, there's increased estrogen that increases the risk of these adenomas. Up till now, there is no CO marker that has been um, recognized to be useful in uh, either diagnosing or uh, management of hepatocellular adenomas. Uh, certain markers such as uh, C-reactive proteins can be increased in uh, inflammatory adenomas. Uh, however, they are not clinically used. Also, uh, alpha fetoprotein is mostly normal in hepatic adenomas. Um, hepatic adenomas can uh, show very mild nonspecific um, derangements in uh, uh, liver enzymes. However, in most cases, uh, the liver enzymes are normal. So hepatocellular adenomas uh, can be divided into basically four types. Um, the first three types, the HNF1 alpha inactivated, the beta catenin mutated, and inflammatory uh, type are very well recognized, and they have uh, specific, we utilize specific immunostains to categorize those adenomas. Um, however, there are uh, about 10% of the adenomas are unclassified. So HN, uh, HNF1 alpha inactivated hepatocellular adenoma uh, occurs due to biallelic inactivation of HNF1 alpha gene. HNF1 uh, alpha gene actually positively regulates um, fatty acid binding protein gene 1. And uh, this FABP1 gene actually encodes for liver fatty acid binding protein, uh, also known as fatty acid binding protein 1. Um, fatty acid uh, binding proteins are the most abundant cytosolic proteins in the cell, and they metabolize long chain fatty acid. There are about 15 members uh, of this uh, of these proteins. Um, the liver fatty acid binding proteins accounts for about two to five percent of hepatic cytosolic proteins and it is widely and diffusely expressed in normal parasites. So the biallelic inactivation of this gene leads to loss of liver fatty acid binding protein expression that can um, that can be seen uh, or that can be actually diagnosed uh, by utilization of uh, a specific immunostain. And this is um, what defines this category. They account for um, about 30 to 40 percent of all adenomas. Uh, 90 percent of these cases are sporadic um, with somatic inactivation of HNF1 alpha gene. Again, greater than 90% um, of these uh, adenomas occur in women. And uh, this uh, phenotype and uh, this uh, adenoma um, demonstrates a steatotic phenotype. So in most of the cases, you will see a background of steatosis. 
And characteristically, uh, they show um, loss of expression of liver fat acid binding protein. Um, they have a small risk of progression to uh, HCC, which is about 7%. Um, a small percentage of these adenomas um, occur as a result of a germline mutation of HNF1 alpha gene. Uh, which leads to inactivation of uh, this gene. And this germline mutation is associated with um, maturity, maturity onset diabetes uh, type 3. Um, one of the characteristics of uh, this germline mutation is that it results in uh, hepatic adenosis, where multifocal adenomas are formed in these patients. Um, this is a core biopsy that uh, actually um, shows both normal uh, background liver and adenoma liver. As you can see, the cells of the adenoma um, are very bland. Uh, there's a little difference between the background liver and the adenoma. You can see a little bit of microvesicular steatosis over here. Um, so that is why, you know, um, utilization of immuno histochemistry is uh, very critical uh, uh, because uh, there are very uh, few um, features that can be recognized on uh, HNE. Um, this is uh, the liver uh, fatty acid binding protein um, immunostochemistry, and it very nicely demonstrates uh, the adenoma over here, which show loss of expression. This is uh, more of a classical um, morphology of um, uh, this type of adenoma. As uh, you can see over here, um, there's uh, macrovesicular steatosis. Uh, this macrovesicular steatosis, um, in many cases, is not, does not involve sometimes the entire uh, tumor. Uh, as you can see over here, there is, uh, um, it is absent in this region. And this whole uh, section is actually an adenoma. Uh, another feature uh, that is uh, that can be is seen um, on reticulin stain, uh, which is uh, uh, very uh, characteristic of this type of adenoma, is uh, packeting of hepatocytes. And it is characterized by uh, reticulin stain that encircles individual hepatocytes, as you can see, or small groups of hepatocytes. And uh, this packeting, you can see, can um, very nicely be uh, differentiated from uh, non-neoplastic background liver, where uh, reticulin is typically expressed along the sinusoids. Next uh, is the beta catenine mutated uh, paracel adenomas. They occur mostly in males, and uh, they frequently show cytoarchitectural uh, abnormalities. That includes uh, cytological atypia, small cell change, uh, presence of pseudoglandular or acinar architecture, and also cause sometimes cause uh, focal reticulin loss. Uh, important thing to remember about these adenomas is that they are high risk, and many people actually um, have debated that probably they should be uh, categorized as well differentiated adenocarcinomas. The highlight of these uh, adenomas uh, is basically mutations in uh, the CTNNB1 or the beta catenin gene. The most common mutations are seen in axon uh, 3. Um, these mutations uh, result in activation of the wind signaling pathway that um, uh, causes, uh, in turn, causes activation of the um, glutamine ammonia ligase gene. Uh, this gene uh, encodes for uh, glutamine synthetase. And glutamine, glutamine synthetase is an enzyme um, that uh, catalyzes the condensation of glutamic acid uh, and ammonia to form uh, glutamine. Um, it is primarily located in liver, brain, and kidneys. Um, and it is basically an indirect... Um, a surrogate marker for uh, activation of beta catenin pathway. Uh, so this table uh, actually shows various type of um, uh, mutations uh, in the beta catenin gene. Uh, the first three mutations that occur in axon three um, result in very strong activation of 
this beta catenin pathway. This uh, results in uh, actually accumulation of this beta catenin in the nuclei, which can be demonstrated by immunostochemistry. Um, and also another very important thing uh, to note about this is that this activation causes strong and diffuse expression of glutamine synthetase. Um, these uh, adenomas which uh, harbor these uh, mutations uh, have a high risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma. The last uh, three mutations uh, that occur on exon 3, uh, these are actually point mutations that occur on exon 3, 7, and 8, cause weak, weak activation of, um, uh, of the beta catenin uh, pathway, uh, or the WIND uh, pathway, and um, it does not uh, result in accumulation of beta catenin in, in the nuclei. That's why you will see negative staining. And also it will cause weak or patchy staining, which is uh, defined as um, a diffuse heterogeneous staining uh, with glutamine synthetase. And these are associated with low risk of developing HCC. Glutamine uh, synthetase uh, expression can also be seen um, in focal modular hyperplasia, um, where it uh, shows a characteristic, you know, map-like positivity. Um, this uh, this expression uh, or this uh, occurs, uh, this increased expression of uh, glutamine synthetase in um, focal nodular hyperplasia occurs uh, without any mutation uh, in the beta catenin pathway which is uh, consistent with its polyclonal uh, origin. Hepatocellular carcinomas are also known to have increased expression of glutamine synthetase. Uh, there are uh, two patterns that should be recognized. Um, the first is the diffuse homogeneous pattern um, where uh, the adenoma will uh, have a very strong and diffuse positivity in greater than 90% of the cells and the diffuse heterogeneous pattern now, that can sometimes create difficulties and it has less specificity. And this is um, uh, this is when you see um, glutamine uh, synthase, synthase positivity in um, greater than 50% of the cells, but less than 90%. This is... Um, the normal expression of glutamine synthetase um, in a non-neoplastic liver. And as you can see, it is uh, uh, primarily, um, it is staining the perivenular or zone three hepatocytes. This is a beta catenin uh, stain that shows, uh, as you can see, a lot of the nuclei are positive um, in this adenoma. An important thing to note uh, about beta catenin and nuclear staining is that you only require 1% of the cells to be positive uh, in order to call it a beta catenin mutated HCA. So you have to look very hard. Uh, you have to just even, uh, you know, try to find very few or rare cells that will make it uh, a beta catenin uh, positive adenoma. Uh, this is a glutamine synthetase, uh, which is uh, again, very strongly and diffusely positive in this adenoma. And this uh, is due to, again, activating uh, mutations in the exon three of the CTNNB gene. And here is uh, the comparison uh, with normal pattern of glutamine synthetase expression. This is a, a, a demonstration of uh, glutamine synthetase in uh, focal nodular hyperplasia as uh, you can see over here, uh, it is expressed uh, in a map-like pattern. Next uh, are the inflammatory adenomas. These uh, adenomas are actually the most common. Uh, they account for about 40 to 50% of uh, all hepatocellular adenomas. Uh, fatty liver disease is a risk factor, and typically they occur in patients who have um, fatty liver disease due to uh, metabolic syndrome or due to steatohepatitis. Um, one of the main genetic aberrations that occur in this type of um, uh, adenoma is uh, activation of IL-6 JAK STAT pathway, which is uh, due to activating mutations uh, in the swallowing genes. In about 60% of the cases, it is the mutation in this uh, IL-6 ST gene. 
Um, about 10% of these uh, adenomas can also show beta-catenin mutations. If you uh, see such case, you have to call it inflammatory adenoma with beta-catenin mutation. And these are, uh, again, these are high-risk adenomas. Um, inflammatory adenomas uh, are characterized by diffuse expression of acute phase reactants. And the two uh, most common markers that are used are C-reactive protein and serum amyloid-associated protein. Um, both are widely used. Um, and they are essential in diagnosis of this type of adenoma. Histologically, uh, this type of adenoma has very characteristic features that can be recognized on H&E. Um, and I will show you in the next slide. Um, first of all, you, uh, in this, um, if you look at this image, you'll see that there is a dilatation of the sinusoids. Um, this is a, a feature that can be seen in many of the uh, adenomas, uh, it, and mostly it is focal. Also, inflammatory adenomas um, can uh, show um, macrovasicular steatosis. So if you see um, steatosis, it does not mean that it is the uh, HNF1 alpha uh, inactivated adenoma. It can be seen in other. That is why uh, you know uh, employment of uh, these specific immunostains is necessary. Over here, uh, uh, you can see that uh, this adenoma, uh, the inflammatory adenomas, can have areas where there is um, uh, lymphocytic inflammation. And another uh, characteristic of this type of adenomas is uh, formation of these pseudoporter tract, which are characterized by presence of these um, arterioles. Um, which, is, which are embedded in a fibrous stroma. There's some inflammation, and also you can see accompanying a bioductular proliferation. So they just look like uh, portal tracts. And this is uh, actually one of the characteristic features of this type of um, adenoma. However, uh, you know, the confirmation requires, um, uh, you know, expression of uh, either C-reactive uh, protein or serum amyloid-associated uh, uh, protein by immunostochemistry. Uh, and over here, you can see that uh, this adenoma is expressing diffusely both of these markers. Um, uh, CRP is actually is slightly preferred, and actually it is uh, one of the markers that uh, we use in our lab. It has a higher sensitivity and is seen in almost, you know, or uh, in all cases, in the in some cases it might not be positive in hundred percent of the uh, of the adenoma cells, but it will be positive at least you know focally. Serum uh, um, the SSA protein is actually seen in about eighty to ninety percent um, of adenomas, so it is slightly less specific. Then uh, about ten percent of the adenomas are actually unclassified. Um, and um, there are several entities uh, in this group. The two entities uh, that are um, mentioned here um, are actually, uh, they're recognized because of their increased risk of bleeding. Um, the adenomas uh, that causes uh, activation of sonic hedgehog pathway um, account for almost 4% of uh, autopathic adenomas. And uh, this is uh, actually caused by a deletion in NAB gene that results in fusion of uh, this uh, NAB and uh, GLE-1 genes. Uh, and um, the resulting uh, fusion gene uh, can cause um, increased expression of uh, prostaglandin T synthase. And this can be actually, um, uh, this increased expression can be seen by immunostochemistry. Um, the Arginosuccinate uh, positive subtype um, is also less frequent, and initially it was uh, it was also associated with increased risk of bleeding. However, uh, some recent uh, studies uh, negate this finding. Um, some other types of adenomas include uh, the ad androgen adenomas. Uh, they arise um, in the setting of exogenous androgen use. And they characteristically show um, a lot of cytological atypia and fre frequently demonstrates cholestasis and small pseudoglands. And they can actually have overlapping features and they can be 
put into any of the uh, you know well defined uh, categories of adenomas they can be hnf1 alpha inactivated inflammatory or some of them also show beta catenin inactivation then we have uh, pigmented adenomas that result in um, deposition of uh, uh, of uh, increased amount of lipofuscin. Uh, they are also associated with cytological atypia with and can show beta activation and uh, also have increased risk of malignant transformation. The mixoid hepatic adenom adenomas are characterized by abundant mixoid material that is dissecting through the that is seen dissecting through the tumor. Um, one of the characteristic features of this type of adenoma is that it shows um, loss of uh, liver fatty acid uh, binding protein. However, this type of adenoma is not um, categorized as HNF1 alpha inactivated because it has a, a very high risk of malignant transformation. So it is still a separate entity. Uh, important thing to uh, know um, uh, when utilizing the adenoma panel is that all the immunostains that are used uh, for uh, diagnosing or classifying uh, paracellular adenomas can also be expressed or can show loss of expression in hepatocellular carcinomas. As you can see in this table, that glutamine synthetase and uh, uh, C-reactive protein can be uh, expressed in about 50% of hepatocellular carcinomas. And uh, this image um, actually shows uh, a well differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, which is positive for C reactive protein and serum amyloid associated protein. Here we have a um, fibrolamellar carcinoma that is showing loss of uh, liver fatty acid binding protein and it is showing also expression of C-reactive protein. So therefore, um, you know, uh, be aware of this fact. Um, do not uh, use these uh, markers for hepatocellular uh, carcinomas. TD34 uh, can also um, be uh, helpful uh, sometimes in um, basically uh, identifying adenomas. However, the main role of uh, CD34 is uh, it can differentiate lesional versus non-lesional tissue. It should not be used to differentiate hepatic adenomas from hepatocellular uh, carcinomas. Um, as you can see over here, uh, this is an adenoma over here, uh, which is showing diffuse uh, arterialization uh, with, uh, of the sinusoids with CD34. Um, CD34 is typically um, more diffusely expressed in paracellular carcinomas, whereas um, it is said that in adenomas, it is patchy. Um, but, um, you know, it, it can be difficult, um, especially when you are uh, making the diagnosis on a, uh, on a core biopsy. Um, so it is best to use this um, marker uh, to differentiate uh, lesional tissue from the non-lesional tissue. Now, um, in the second part, I'm going to discuss uh, various subtypes or variants of hepatocellular carcinomas. In order to be considered uh, as a subtype uh, of hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, this subtype should uh, demonstrate four elements. It should have a distinctive histological findings that are consistently present. Um, and uh, this should be strong enough to make a strong diagnosis. This criteria is typically the first to be recognized by the pathologist. The next three criteria improve the specificity and add the clinical meaning uh, to, the, to the subtype. Immunohistochemistry and um, uh, other confirmatory testing is another important um, criteria. This criteria significantly improves um, specificity, making the subtype more meaningful for clinical care and for research studies. Third is clinical correlates. 
the type and strength of clinical correlates vary considerably among uh, various subtypes. And this criteria makes the subtype clinically meaningful. Unique uh, molecular findings. Uh, this is uh, actually a very important criteria that provides an insight into the potential treatment targets and can uh, feed back into this uh, criteria number two, uh, serving as the basis for molecular and immunostochemically based confirmatory tests. This is the table um, that um, actually uh, uh, taken from a very recent um, a review uh, by Dr. Toberson, who is uh, one of the leading experts uh, in hepatocellular neoplasms. And it shows various subtypes uh, of hepatocellular uh, uh, carcinomas. Um, the ones that are highlighted in these blue boxes are the ones that are recognized by WHO. So there are uh, eight subtypes uh, highlighted over here that are recognized by WHO. Um, also, it is important to uh, know that about 30%, 35% of all um, paracellular carcinomas can be classified as variants. I will start with fibrolamellar um, paracellular carcinoma, which is one of the very well-recognized uh, variants. Uh, it accounts for 1% uh, uh, of all HCCs occur in young patient. The median age is 25 to 26 years. Uh, one of the important characteristics of this type of adenoma, uh, of uh, this uh, carcinoma subtype, is that it occurs in background uh, uh, which does not show any cirrhosis. So these patients have no background cirrhosis. Also, clinically, uh, there are only few cases, uh, few patients who will show uh, a mild elevation of AFP. Most of them, AFP will be normal. Um, it can show elevation of serum uh, B12 binding protein. Uh, the prognosis of this type uh, is presumed to be better, but uh, some of the recent studies have shown that uh, prognosis is the same as uh, the classical uh, varicellar carcinoma. Another feature of this um, subtype, it uh, tends to metastasize into the lymph nodes uh, in 75 percent of the cases, um, as opposed to uh, uh, classical HCC, which show only 5% uh, of the cases with uh, lymph node metastasis. This um, subtype of uh, the, the fibrolamellar HCC has a very characteristic novel genetic alteration. And this is um, actually a recurrent somatic intrachromosomal microdeletion uh, on chromosome 19. It's about 400 uh, kilobase deletion that leads to fusion of uh, these two genes, the DNA, JB1, that encodes for a subunit of heat shock protein 40, and the PRACA gene that encodes uh, for the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A. The fusion gene encodes for a chimeric protein that retains full um, uh, activity of protein kinase A. And this is uh, this increased level of PRACA uh, actually uh, leads to tumorigenesis. Pyrolmeller uh, parasitic carcinomas can be very large uh, and can be vascularly, vascularly invasive. Um, on histology, uh, they are characterized by large tumor cells um, with very well-defined cell borders. They have large nucleoli, abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, and um, uh, it shows increased lamellar fibrosis. They can also show uh, these characteristic intracytoplasmic pale bodies and highland globules. Um, another uh, unique feature of this um, type of varicellar um, carcinoma is uh, its unique immunoprofile. These tumors are um, positive for cytokeratin 7, uh, which is expressed in only 20 to 30 percent of classical uh, HCCs. And also they are positive for uh, CD68, which can also be positive in a small percentage of HCCs, like about 10 percent. So this unique combination of um, 
cytokeratin 7 and CD68 positivity is very helpful in diagnosis uh, of in diagnosing this uh, subtype. Uh, this is a gross picture that is uh, showing um, uh, this fibrillomator uh, uh, carcinoma. And as you can see, it has a, a, a white tan cut surface, and it is typically, they are very firm. Um, and also uh, note the background level that is uh, showing absence of any cirrhosis. Um, on histology, uh, these are characterized by um, presence of uh, these tumor cells that have um, abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, very prominent nucleoli, um, and uh, they have uh, also prominent cell walls. You can see the lamellar fibrosis, um, here these uh, fibrous septi that are uh, seen intervening in the tumor, and also characteristic uh, pale bodies and um, highlight globules that are uh, seen in this uh, uh, subtype. Uh, this is the cytological. Uh, this is actually our case. Uh, we actually diagnosed this um, on cytology. And um, uh, one of the characteristic features on cytology that you can see over here are these oncocytoid type of cells with very abundant cytoplasm, prominent nucleoli. Uh, this is the immunohistochemistry profile, again, showing very strong uh, and nice positivity with CK7 and also positivity with uh, C CD68 which is unique um, for this variant. In most cases, in vast majority of the cases, uh, it is the h &E and uh, utilization of immunostochemical markers that will give you this diagnosis. However, uh, if there is still a doubt, uh, there's a prac of fish uh, that can actually uh, uh, diagnose um, uh, this uh, fusion, uh, the characteristic fusion of this PRACA gene. Um, and uh, that can be utilized in certain cases if there's any doubt. Next is the SCRS uh, subtype. Um, about 5% of HCCs exhibit prominent stroma. Um, but in order to qualify for this uh, subtype, um, about 50% of the tumors sh uh, should show extensive uh, or very broad bands of fibrosis. Uh, the clinical characteristic of this subtype subtype is uh, very similar to classic HCC. Um, however, uh, this subtype has um, some very characteristic features um, uh, that are uh, seen uh, radiologically. Um, and uh, these features can uh, overlap with intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinomas. And that is why this, uh, this tumor, um, uh, this subtype can be misdiagnosed. Um, and uh, these include um, peripheral uh, enhancement um, in the arterial phase and um, uh, absence of enhancement um, in the central uh, zone of the tumor uh, in the venous phase. Um, molecularly, uh, also, it shows overlapping features with um, intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinomas. Um, there are some genetic aberrations uh, that has been associated with uh, uh, with this subtype that includes mutations in the uh, TSE uh, one and two genes, and also aberrations in TGF beta signaling that cause it, causes its activation. However, these uh, genetic uh, mutations are not strong enough to define this category. Um, most recent studies have shown that this. Um, tumor, uh, this subtype uh, has an aggressive behavior and a poor prognosis. Uh, another feature, uh, and other, uh, you know, uh, characteristic feature of uh, this type, um, this subtype of pedicellar carcinoma is that they tend to occur in the subcapsular location and offer, uh, often lack a capsule. Um, they have a very firm um, cut surface because of increased fibrosis, and they can resemble intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. They also have unique immunostochemical profile, um, rather unique. Um, about 50% of these cases are negative for common hepatocellular markers uh, uh, that are utilized for diagnosing uh, hepatocellular carcinomas, such as HEPAR and polyclonal CEA. And about two thirds of these tumors express uh, cytokeratin seven and uh, cytokeratin nineteen. 
Um, also, majority of these uh, uh, tumors are positive for uh, glipican 3 and arginase. And um, uh, reticulin, which is uh, very commonly employed in diagnosis of HCC, um, actually can show a very normal type of pattern in this type, uh, in, in, in scirrus uh, HCCs. Now, this is the classical um, morphology on HNE. And as you can see, uh, the, uh, there are these broad fibrous uh, bands of uh, dense fibrosis. Um, and uh, it is separating these thin uh, tumor tuberculae. Um, these tumors can also, um, you know, sometimes show presence of pale bodies um, and um, intracytoplasmic uh, hyaline glo globules as, uh, uh, as seen in fibrolamellar carcinomas. Next is the steatohepatitic variant. Um, it is um, one of the most common uh, subtypes of HCC, accounting for about 5 to 20% of cases. Um, in order to qualify for this diagnosis, the steatohepatitis should be present in more than 50% of the tumor, and it should show the typical features of steatohepatitis. That includes presence of macrovesicular steatosis, lymphocytic inflammation, ballooning, uh, malary dank bodies, and pericellular fibrosis. Um, although most of the experts believe that you should see all those five features, but some say if you see three of the five, that should be okay. Um, but again, uh, this uh, morphology of uh, steatohepatitis should be the dominant component of the tumor. Um, and uh, this uh, variant is strongly associated with metabolic syndrome, um, uh, or with chronic alcohol use. Most of these tumors uh, are uh, well to moderately differentiated and uh, they have a staining profile that is similar to the conventional HCCs. Um, they can also be positive for C-reactive protein. Um, uh, several... We have to start this second lecture. Second lecture is of Dr. Anil Pavani and who is uh, giving his lecture virtually but live. Good morning, Dr. Anil uh, Pavani, and uh, I am sorry about the bit of the delay. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Pavani um, is kind enough to uh, give his second lecture today after he gave a wonderful uh, overview of uh, <clears throat> digital pathology and <clears throat> artificial intelligence uh, in pathology. Uh, so today he will be discussing updates and uh, in the classification and nomenclature immunohistochemistry on the adult renal neoplasm. Dr. Anil Parvani is a professor of pathology in the University of Ohio. Uh, he is uh, very well published and uh, have, have, has published more than 300 articles and book chapters. Um, Dr. Parvani is also um, <clears throat> editor-in-chief of uh, Diagnostic Pathology, a very reputable pathology journal, and he's also one of the editors of uh, Journal of Pathology Informatics. Um, uh, so, uh, Dr. Parvani, uh, we are pleased to have you again today as well. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, you can start uh, now. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. And you can see the screen? Yes, sir. The full screen, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much. Uh, I will, today I'm, I'm going to talk to you about kidney cancers and uh, give you an update on the new WHO classification of kidney tumors, adult kidney tumors. So renal cell carcinomas um, so renal cell carcinomas have are complex, changing and evolving. So they have a wide spectrum of morphological appearances. Some of these tumors can 
have cytoplasmic features, which are unique, architectural features, or they have a specific disease background, like a quiet cystic disease, RCCs, but many of them have molecular alterations. So what we are learning about these tumors is we are understanding more and more about the molecular changes that occur in these tumors. So the classification of renal cell carcinomas dates all the way back to 1996, where the first WHO meeting occurred. They talked about classifying renal tumors. And now more recently, uh, the WHO 2022, we found we have a list of new tumors which are molecularly defined. So you can, if you just look at the classic things that I learned when I was a resident was clear cell RCC, papillary RCC, chromophobe, collecting duct. We are now dealing with new molecularly defined epithelial renal tumors, such as smart B1 deficient medullary RCC, TFEB a rearranged RCCs and others. So this is the new WHO classification of renal cell tumors. So you can see we have clear cell renal tumors, papillary renal tumors, oncocytic and chromophobe renal tumors, collecting tumors, metanephric tumors, and other renal tumors, which are either emerging tumors or are well-established. So I'm going to focus on some of these entities, but there's also a new list of molecularly defined RCC that includes translocation tumors, ELOC carcinomas, FH deficient RCCs. So a very simplistic way to think about is renal cell tumors that are molecularly defined overlap tumors which are oncocytic, tumors with clear cells or tumors with blue cells. So this emerging spectrum of renal cell tumors um, have uh, now include um, several molecularly defined RCCs. So let's talk about the clear cell renal cell tumors. That includes the classic RCCs and a multilocular cystic RCC of low malignant potential. So this is a clear cell renal cell carcinoma and this also includes a cystic renal neoplasm of low malignant potential. So this is a classic gross appearance of an RCC. So if you have a smartphone or a cell phone, you can scan this QR code and you can actually see the tumor on your phone, a whole slide image of it. And again, this will be made available to all the attendees. So you can also scan it later and study these tumors. So when you open your image, you're going to see a classic renal cell carcinoma, clear cell type, clear cytoplasm, very, very fine fibrillary network, cytoplasmic processes, very fine round uniform nuclei, which have a central nucleolus. So this is your classic renal cell carcinoma clear cell type. All right, so tumors that are, the next case is a 56 year old man has an incidental four centimeter mass. Total nephrectomy is done. And this is what you see. So scarring and the arrows show the highlighted areas. So this is the second case. So if you scan it again, you can see this tumor. So here is the tumor and this is the capsule, which is very well defined. So at first glance, this might look like a clear cell RCC, right? But notice the nuclei are located 
peripherally. They are facing the lumen of the tumors. So higher power view, the nucle nuclei are luminally located. They are pointing to the lumen. That this is a low-grade tumor. If you stain this with CA9, it stains strongly. If you stain with CK7, it also stains very strongly. So this is a different staining pattern than a classic clear cell. And then Amakar or race mace is negative. CD10 is negative. So this is a clear cell papillary renal cell tumor. So we, we now call this clear cell papillary renal cell tumor. It's renamed from a carcinoma to a tumor due to uniformly indolent behavior. So these patients do really well. This is a low stage, low grade tumor with tubular papillary and cystic architecture. And it's composed of clear cells with linearly aligned luminally or oriented nuclei. And they stain with CK7 and CA9. So this is now the fourth most common histological type of RCCs. So if you see a clear cell and papillary tumor, it should be, in your, clear cell papillary tumor should be in your differential diagnosis. In needle biopsies of small tumors, we I routinely do these four stains now. And it's important because if the patient has poor, is a poor surgical candidate, Clear cell papillary tumor may be treated conservatively by active surveillance. So it does these patients may not need a surgery. All right, so let's talk about uh, so it, so now this tumor, clear cell papillary, belongs to this other renal tumor category. All right, so the next case is a 48-year-old male who presents with evaluation of a left renal mass, has a 1.6 centimeter enhancing renal mass, and it's concerning for renal cell carcinoma. A partial nephrectomy is done, and this is what we see. So it looks like there is some clear cytoplasm, there is collagenous stroma, there is maybe some smooth muscle bundles which are in between these tumor cells. So this is another tumor which has recently been described. Anybody has any thoughts? It's CK7 positive, but not uniformly, only focally. CD10 positive, CA9 is positive. So it's staining like a clear cell. Vimentin is positive. So what's your likely diagnosis? So in fact, this is a renal cell carcinoma with stroma. So the unique thing about this tumor is it does not have the classic deletion in the chromosome 3P, which you always see with a clear cell RCC. So based on histomorphological features, this is a unique tumor. Um, so this tumor is called renal cell carcinoma with lyomyomatous smooth muscle stroma. Now we know that these tumors have recurrent mutations of TSC1 and TSC2, mTOR and or ELOC. So it's consistent with a hyperactive mTOR complex, which is very well defined fine, well-characterized now, and we can actually treat patients with this type of genetic changes. So this tumor is now part of the new molecularly defined RCCs, which include TFE3 tumors, which include elk rearranged RCCs. So now let's talk about papillary renal cell tumors. So the updates in the 20, W22 is uh, we now have 
papillary adenomas and papillary RCCs. So this is the third case which, for which you have a whole slide image available for you to study. So we used to type our papillary RCCs, but based on data and based on the updates in the WHO 2022, we do not need to subtype papillary RCCs. We just simply call them papillary renal cell carcinomas. So we don't call them subtype one or two like we used to. Papillary adenomas are now defined as up to 1.5 centimeter. So if you have a tumor which looks like a papillary renal cell carcinoma, always ask how big is it? So if it's less than 1.5 centimeter, you call them papillary adenomas. All right. So the next case I want to show is a 64-year-old male, incidentally found to have a right renal mass, and it's a 2.4 centimeter exophytic septated cystic tumor. And this is what you see. So it's very well confined. It has a cystic growth pattern. And at higher power, this is what you see. So it looks like a papillary tumor, right? So if you look at higher power, you have round uniform nuclei, but tumor looks very eosinophilic. And there are very cystic edematous areas. It almost has a flower-like appearance. Some areas of calcification, cholesterol clefting. So our differential diagnosis is it's a papillary RCC. It's an FH deficient RCC, oncocytic tumor, a papillary adenoma, but it's greater than 1.5. So it's a, it's a carcinoma or it's a papillary renal neoplasm with reverse polarity, which is, so if you look at the IHC profile, staining with PAX8, and it's staining with 7, and FH is positive, so there's no loss. But interestingly, GATA3 stain is positive in these tumors. So this is the GATA3 stain. So when you test these tumors genetically, they have a Keras exon 2 mutation. And so this is a new, newly described tumor. It's called papillary renal neoplasm with reverse nuclear polarity. So it has a papillary architecture, but and is a monolayered tumor cells looks very pink. Nuclei are polarized away from the basal membrane and it has a very low nuclear grade. So it has GATA3 expression and a KRAS missense mutation. It is an indolent renal tumor and should be designated as a neoplasm and not a carcinoma. But it needs to be differentiated from papillary renal cell carcinomas due to its better prognosis and less extensive surgery would be the appropriate management of these patients. So it's a very interesting tumor with very unique morphology, immunoprofile, and molecular findings. So this tumor is an emerging provisional tumor, still not part of the classification. So that includes several other tumors like eosinophilic vacuolated tumors. So just be aware that in the next WHO, maybe five, six years from now, these emerging tumors might become more classified entities. We are collecting data on these tumors. We are sequencing these tumors. We are understanding more and more about their behavior. All right, so the next case is a 49-year-old female with a renal mass. So this is your W, this is your whole slide image. So it looks very blue at low power, but has uh, elongated tubular structures, slit-like spaces, 
very uh, tubular papillary pack, uh, type of architecture, very round, low-grade nuclei, and mucin in the background, mucin tumor, mucinous uh, background. In some places, it looks very spindly, like a sarcomatoid tumor. So this is the mucinous tubular and spindle cell carcinoma. It's a rare tumor, mostly seen in women, has, is circumscribed. So the classic things you see with these are in interconnecting tubular and spindle architecture within a mixoid stroma. Low-grade nuclei, female predominance, very benign or indolent clinical course. And there is no unique genetic changes as multiple losses. So this tumor is also part of the other renal cell tumors. So including mucinous tumors, eosinophilic tumors and others. What about oncocytic tumors? So in the new WHO, we have oncocytoma, we have the chromosome renal cell carcinomas and other oncocytic tumors. So this is a classic chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. There is perinuclear halos, resinoid nuclei, cobblestoning, very prominent cytoplasmic membranes. And you, you have, I have scanned a case of uh, chromophobe RCC for you to review. You can, you can review it when you see this PowerPoint. So this is a classic chromophobe, perinuclear halos. Very rigid cytoplasmic membranes, almost we call this cobblestoning. So classic perinuclear halos, this is a chromophobe RCC. And you think of it as cobblestoning, which is shown here. All right, so the next tumor, is a 49-year-old female with end-stage renal disease presented with renal mass. Partial nephrectomy was done. And this is the case. So it's a it, tumor has a variable papillary architecture. Has It's very pink cytoplasm and very prominent nucleoli has crystals, if you see these crystals here. So these are characteristic intratumoral oxalate crystals. Has intercellular luminal holes, which gives it a cribriform appearance. It doesn't have a unique immunoprofile. CK7 can be positive focally, Amacar is positive, so it does not have a unique profile. So it's staining. So it lacks 3P losses. There are gains in several chromosomes. So it doesn't have classic 717 trans trisomies and loss of Y, which you characteristically see in papillary renal cell carcinoma. So it's not a papillary renal cell carcinoma. So this is an acquired cystic kidney disease associated renal cell carcinoma. This tumor occurs in ACE acquired cystic disease patients is either a dominant mass or a non-dominant mass. It's non-aggressive, low T stage. And this tumor also is in the new WHO. It's part of the other renal tumors. All right, next case. So this is a young patient, 31 year old, has a tumor which is 2.5 by 3.1 centimeter in the posterior mid pole and a radical nephrectomy is done. So this is what you see, tumors with um, nested or tubular growth pattern Nuclei, tumor cells are oval in shape, contain smooth uniform nuclei, but don't 
you don't see a nucleolus as prominently. So this is what the tumor looks like. You can see some mast cells in these tumors, very pink cytoplasm. And if you look at them, electro electron microscopy, you see uh, cytoplasm with enlarged mitochondria. But some, in some places, the tumor has cystic spaces and there is very flocculent cytoplasm, very vacuolated. So if you stain it, PAX8 is positive, CK7 is negative, STHB stain is negative. So there is a loss of STHB. So in your differential are all these entities, but this is a tumor which has succinate dehydrogenase deficiency. So this is the most common germ line mutation seen in STH deficient RCCs, including STHP and STHC. It's very rare, less than 0.2%, and it's more commonly seen in men versus women. Younger patients. So this tumor is now is part of the molecularly defined tumors. All right, so let's keep going. I'm trying to show you at least one tumor from each of these categories. So this is a 26-year-old, 14-week pregnant female who has this tumor while she was pregnant. So this is the case. So it's a tumor which has clear cytoplasm, has samoma bodies, has a papillary growth pattern. So if you look at it, it large amount of cytoplasm. We call it voluminous cytoplasm. Very prominent round nuclei with nucleoli. Samoma bodies. And this tumor is staining with TFE. Three. So just another example of the tumor. It looks very clear cytoplasm and staining with TFE3. It's not staining with cytokeratin. Usually this tumor has very weak or no staining with cytokeratins. So this is a TFE3 rearranged RCC. We used to call these MIT fee family XP11 translocations. But now we call these tumors as TFE3 rearranged RCCs. We also have another group of tumors called TFEB rearranged RCCs. So this tumor in involves translocation in XP11. It's a gene fusion involving TFE3 transcription factor. And the test that we do in the lab is looking for nuclear labeling by IHC, typically it's younger patients, and in some cases, association with prior chemotherapy. So the clues are young patient, papillary architecture, but with clear cytoplasm, samoma bodies, minimal immunoreactivity with cytokeratin, and positive staining with TFE3 immunostain. All right, so. Let me show you another case. This is a female in her early 40s with history of end-stage renal disease due to diabetic nephropathy. Has a 4.5, 4.3 centimeter by 4.9 centimeter mass and a radical nephrectomy is performed. So you can see the tumor, it's located in the lower pole it has very hemorrhagic appearance. It's multicystic. The cyst is very either clear or bloody fluid. But this tumor has granular eosinophilic cytoplasm. Very uh, occasional nuclear binucleated, finely granular cytoplasm with some cytoplasmic stippling, some vacuolation in the cytoplasm. 
So it's a very unique appearance. Some places are very cystic, like this, but very enlightened by very sort of plasmic granularity. So it's PAX8 positive. CK7 is negative. So it's not a chromophobe of RCC. CK20 is positive. So it's one of the one of the first uh, one of the very few renal tumors which have CK20 staining. So if you see a pink tumor like I just showed you, think about ordering a CK20 immunostain. CD10 is positive. So your differential includes all these entities. But this is an eosinophilic solid and cystic RCC. Positive FH. But the key stain is the CK20. So it's one of the very rare renal tumors which has cytokeratin 20 staining. The cytokeratin 20 staining can be diffuse or very focal. So these tumors also have, in addition to the CK20 staining, they also harbor TSC mutations. So if you do a genetic assay, you can see TSC mutations in this tumor. So this is the eosinophilic solid and cystic RCC. And it belongs to the other renal tumors. All right, so in conclusions, I showed you some examples of new and emerging entities which are being added to the classification of RCCs, either due to unusual histological appearances or due to advances in immunohistochemistry, cytogenetics, or molecular genetics. Molecular gen diagnostic tests are being increasingly used for further characterizing renal neoplasms. And it's important for us as pathologists to recognize these entities because this will dictate how successfully these patients are treated, what uh, and appropriate therapeutic strategies can be um, taken. So with this, I want to thank you all for your attention. And I'm going to, I have 300 more slides to show, but I will stop now because <laughs> everybody needs a break. And I'm here for questions, if you have any. I will share the presentation with you all. And uh, all these presentations, on my PowerPoint, you will have a QR code, which will take you to a whole slide image for these tumors that I, dis uh, that I discussed today. So I have a large collection of very unique kidney tumors, which are available on this site as well. Sure. Thank you. We, we appreciate that. Okay, Dr. Parvani, we have very few uh, questions. So one question is, uh, how are you, and uh, I mean, what are you anticipating? So will we have the same kind of uh, classification just like we have in uh, CNS tumors that all is based on, you know, molecular classification? That's where I think after central nervous system tumors, I think renal is the one which is really shifting towards that. So what is your anticipation? Will we be heading towards that soon? I would say probably in the next WHO, you will see many of these emerging tumors mm -hmm. will, be, will be classified molecularly. So in my practice, I maybe see 20 renal tumors a week. And many of them, they look very similar to each other. They're oncocytic tumors. Yeah. But we we can now do a limited number of immunostains and accurately classify them. But some of them, we will need to do molecular on this. But I, I don't think it's going to be just like CNS tumors where molecular classification is a requirement for yeah. all many tumors. Yeah. But, but in general, yes, we are headed towards this in the next 10 years. We will see more entities which are which resemble each other morphologically, have the similar immuno profile, but have yeah. unique genetic changes. So, so I think we're going to we're, we're heading in that direction. On, on that on that note, uh, I, I that's a practical question. Um, uh, more more of a practical question. 
that when we have the new emerging entities in the WHO, you know, you start seeing the cases and you start uh, visualizing that that's what entity is, you know, you, you want to, uh, you know, um, make it that entity, if you will, <laughs> you know, sometimes. But when you diagnose these new entities, so clinician, uh, rightfully so, they ask you, okay, what, what do I do with this, you know? So, so when the WHO itself and articles are still saying that, okay, um, the data is still coming, we don't know, you know, maybe this tumor is behaving like that previously known, this former entity or that former entity. So how do you tackle that in day-to-day -day practice, especially when the burden is on the pathologist to tell that, okay, what, what I need to do, you know? Yeah, so I, so I think what in our practice, we have GU we have subspecialty tumor boards mm -hmm. and we meet with urologists. We talk about these new entities. We, we tell them about what we think best today. And we try to give them examples from what we know about these tumors. If they are emerging tumors or well-established tumors. So we work hand in hand with the oncologist and the urologist to help classify them as best as we can. And we try to collect data from our own institute or other institutes so they can be put on clinical trials. They can be put on, you know, unique therapeutic uh, pathways. Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's a partnership. So I, in, in our institute, we, we do subspecialty tumor boards in urological pathology every two weeks. Yeah. So, and, and it's a partnership with the urologist. Yeah, that makes sense, I think. Yeah, yeah, we do have um, uh, specialized, uh, sub-specialized tumor boards, but yeah, because our audience is not just limited to this hospital. So sometimes it's very challenging uh, to discuss the cases with the outside clinicians. Uh, so so that's, that's what I wanted to ask. So, um, we don't have uh, um, more questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Parvani. Um, it, it had been very rewarding inviting you and hopefully I we will see you soon physically as well. Yes, <laughs> I, I plan, to, plan to visit my family in Pakistan soon. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Have a great day. You too. So, so at the end of this talk, uh, this is the end of first session of uh, pathology. We'll resume at exactly at two o'clock after a uh, prayers break. And I'll pray in the prayers and we have more audience in the hall. Okay, I'll resume at two o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>